when Christians differ, when they disagree with one another about certain beliefs and or certain practices, when they disagree about ministry issues or cultural concerns, and they simply cannot resolve the difference, what should they do? What should they do? In in one sense, that describes the situation, a, a situation that the Apostle Paul addressed in a chapter from our Bible reading plan this past week, Romans 14, Romans 14. We're looking at verse 1 this morning. That's what we're, where we're going to start to try to understand how Paul is addressing this issue of differences among Christians. Consider this instruction. And remember, this instruction is a command given by God through the Apostle Paul. It's an instruction that was written 2,000 years ago through the pen of the Apostle Paul, but it's an instruction that God Himself, the living God, is giving us this morning through His living and active Word. Do you believe that? So let's listen with that very heart, that disposition towards what God says to us here in 14.1. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. Let me read it again. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. Now, even if you are familiar with this verse, familiar with this chapter, it still should raise a number of questions as we think about it this morning. For example, who is this one who is weak in faith? What exactly does that mean? What does it mean to welcome that person? Similarly, what might it look like to quarrel over opinions? Let's tackle some of these questions by looking together at three elements in this verse. Those elements are obvious from the words weak, welcome, and quarrel. Weak, welcome, and quarrel. Okay, so those are the stakes we're going to kind of put down, uh, tie ourselves to those, and that's what we want to explore this morning. So, so that, first of all, we can understand the what and why of Paul's teaching to his original listeners. We want to figure out what's being said here, but we need to do that in order to, second, understand how God wants to instruct us through this portion of His Word. We as Christians hear God by overhearing God. Ever thought about that? We hear God by overhearing God. That is, we're listening in on a conversation that took place millennia ago. And we have to do that in order to hear God today. That's how it works. We understand what Paul was saying to his original listeners. And then we say, God, what are you saying through these words to us? Not the other way around. We don't first say, God, what are you saying to us? Because when we do that, what, do we, what happens? We rip it out of its context. We divorce it from why it was originally written. And when we take it out of that context, guess what? We can, we can give really any meaning we want to the words. We can make it relate to what we're going through now rather than what they were going through then. And we've seen, of course, the abuse of that over the centuries, even today. People taking things out of God's Word and making them relate to, first and foremost, to their own life and having them say what they want them to say, the verse, verses to say, rather than what God has intended through the original writers of Scripture. So with that in mind, and with this roadmap in front of us, what does Paul mean when he talks about someone who is weak in faith? What does he mean, keying off that word weak? Well, Paul explains what he means. Take a look at, back at the chapter, chapter 14. He explains what he means in the very next verse, verse 2. One person, he says, believes, there's the word faith, right? One person believes he may eat anything while the weak person eats only vegetables. So we have two words there, the word believe, which is the word faith. And the word weak in the very next verse. Look what it's telling us. 
it's telling us that if this weakness that we're talking about, the weakness we're trying to understand, were visualized as an individual who cannot lift a particular barbell, right? They can't lift it up. Then Paul identifies that barbell as the belief that Christians, especially Jewish Christians, were no longer bound by the dietary restrictions of the Old Testament. That's what they could not lift up, these, those who were weak in faith. Some Jewish Christians simply could not lift that weight. That is, they could not accept that such foods were no longer off limits. But wait, did the Old Testament actually prescribe only vegetables like it says here? Maybe we're talking about something else. Well, remember who Paul's writing to. He's writing to Jews who are living in the city of Rome. These are urban Christians, and these are Jews living in the midst of Gentiles. What does that mean? It meant that these Jews often struggled to find the kind of meat that was prepared properly for them to eat, or that was not associated in some way with idolatry. 1 Corinthians chapters, chapter 10, or 8 through 10, for example, deals with this issue of how do, you deal, how do you work and think about meat that comes from an idol's temple and makes its way into the marketplace, right? Is it tainted somehow demonically? You can't eat that. So a very similar discussion, some principles here, you'll find in 1 Corinthians chapters 8 through 10. But this is why they were struggling. Some would just choose to eat vegetables because of this difficulty. It is helpful to know, look at verses 5 and 6. It's helpful to note in verses 5 and 6 that Paul expands the conversation to include the observance not only of dietary restrictions, but also the observance of Jewish holy days. And given the language here, in all likelihood, this included Sabbath observance as well. That honoring of the seventh day, Saturday, as a holy day in light of the Old Testament. It, it, it's hard to stress, brothers and sisters, it really is hard to stress how significant these dietary and these holy day distinctives were in shaping Jewish identity in a non-Jewish world. This is how these people thought about themselves for centuries. This is how they thought about themselves. This is what made them different, right? This, was, this, this often would incite maybe slander, uh, mockery from others who would look at them, you know, with like, what are you talking about? You can't eat this or do this. But for them, it was something that they held on to as precious. This was distinct. We do this to honor God. Now, we also know that it would often breed a, a sense of arrogance, right? That people would look down on others, the, the Gentile dogs who were unclean because they did not follow these rules. So I say that simply to say that it's understandable that there were Jewish people in these churches for whom it was difficult to transition away from that. It was difficult to kind of begin to see themselves differently. Many were, many for many, adapting to the fullness and freedom that came through the new covenant in Jesus. It took some time for that to take place. Now, when considering this subject, there are a couple things we need to be crystal clear about. So we've talked about what does weak in faith mean. We've, we've kind of nailed down this idea of the dietary restrictions, holy day, holy day observances from the Old Testament law. When considering this subject, there are a couple of things that we do need to clarify and be really, really firm on. First of all, this issue regarding food was not a gray area. I've heard this chapter, chapter 14, used all sorts of ways in the past. A lot of times people will say, well, this is a chapter about gray areas. Well, yeah, maybe, <laughs> but this is not a gray area. We'll talk about application as we close in on the end of the message this morning. But this here is not a gray area. Jesus was crystal clear, Mark 7, verse 19. Peter was crystal clear, Acts chapter 10. God was crystal clear to Peter in Acts 10 about what was clean and unclean, what was, what was no longer unclean, that is. He had made this clear about the removal of these dietary restrictions. Like so much of the law of Moses, these regulations had served their purpose. They weren't meant to be forever. They served a purpose 
for a time in preparation for the coming of Christ, who was the fullness, right? The other things were shadows, Colossians chapter 2. The substance belongs to Jesus Christ. So these things had served their purpose, and as we see here, uh, they were no longer applicable for any follower of Christ. Paul is also clear in this chapter about this same idea, about li- the lifting of these Old Testament dietary laws. Look at verse 14. I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself. He doesn't simply say, I know. He says, I know and am persuaded. So this is not a gray area. He also affirms this in chapter 14, verse 20. Look at verse 20. Everything is indeed clean. He doesn't want his readers (laughs) to misunderstand what he's saying here. He is saying this is not a gray area. It is black and white. So it is important to remember this as we look at this chapter. The weak in faith here, the weak in faith that Paul is addressing, they did not have an equally valid biblical position. They were wrong in terms of their conclusions. Keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. Second, here's the second thing that you need to know about this idea, these concepts of being weak in faith in these ways. Second, it's also important to stress that the difference of opinion here, Paul, this, this one that Paul ad- is addressing in this chapter, is not a difference over essential beliefs. These are not essential beliefs. Those who were weak in faith were not struggling to believe that Jesus was the Son of God. They were not struggling to believe that He was the Messiah. They were not struggling to believe that He had redeemed them by His own blood. If some were unable to lift those kinds of beliefs, or they believed that their dietary restrictions and observance of those dietary restrictions could save them, then you better believe Paul would be having a very different conversation here with them. If you don't believe me, go to Galatians and read that. Oh, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified? Having begun by the Spirit, will you now continue by the flesh, by the works of the law? So Galatians gives us a glimpse if in fact the issue is that Christians are struggling with this concept of salvation by faith alone, by grace alone through faith alone. That's not the issue here. So these believers in Christ were simply disagreeing about what it looks like to live a life in Christ that is pleasing to God. They know they're saved by grace alone, through faith alone. But in living this new life in a manner worthy, they believe that they need to still adhere to these restrictions, that it's pleasing to God to do so. It glorifies God to do so. So take a look next at this word quarrel. We're going to skip down to the, to the end of verse 1 and pick up that word quarrel. What were these believing brothers and sisters supposed to do about these differences that they had? And remember, remember guys, when they would come together, most of the, the early church, when they came together to be able to celebrate, they came together around a meal called an agape or a love feast. They would come, they would eat together, they would hear the word, they would partake of the elements of the wine and the bread in remembrance of the Lord Jesus, his broken body, his shed blood. They would come together, hear the word, encourage one another. Some would share a psalm, some would share a prophecy, some would share a word of encouragement to the body. There was prayer going on. All those things were taking place here. So around that meal, when you had people who were different in terms of their, what their diet, dietary choices, beyond just kind of a, a, a health thing, this was something different. There was conflict happening, right? There was conflict happening because of what was on the table, what other people were eating, what was a temptation, what was not a temptation, all of that. This was a very real issue in terms of how they met, how they worshiped, how they fellowshiped with one another, so this word quarrel, take a look at the end of verse 1. We find that word, key word quarrel. Do not quarrel over opinions. So listen to how Paul expands on this. What does it mean? He says, do not come together and quarrel over opinions. Well, look at verse 3. 
of chapter 14. He really spells it out more there, doesn't he? Let not the one who eats, that is the one who eats anything because he knows that there's no longer any restriction, let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains. And let not the one who abstains, that is those who felt they still needed to adhere to the restrictions, let not that person pass judgment on the one who eats. Ah, okay, now we get a clearer picture of what's happening in this church. Now we have factions. We have two groups who are, who are quarreling, who are divided over this issue. One group is despising the other group, looking down on the other group, this bro- these brothers and sisters, because of their struggles with faith. And on the other side, those who considered themselves more careful, more observant of God's word, were judging those who were eating whatever they want, whatever they wanted to eat. Now notice how Paul addresses these responses again in verse 10. Do you see verse 10? He's also talking about despising. He's also talking about passing judgment. So in all likelihood, what's happening here at Rome Community Church or Rome Bible Church, whatever you want to call it, was there was a group of people, there were Christians labeling one group as fundamentalists or legalists, while another group might have been denouncing the rest as libertines or liberals. And there's this clashing taking place. There's this clashing taking place. But notice how Paul corrects these temptations to despise or the temptation to judge a brother or sister. Romans 14, look at verse 4. He says, who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? Now, in all likelihood, given the language here and the context, he's talking to those who are weak in faith. He's picked one group here and he said, who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? Who are you to judge someone for eating these foods? Why, why, should they not, why should they take this to heart, what he's saying? It is before his own master that he stands or falls. And he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. Whatever you've decided, dietary restriction group, whatever you've decided, uh, no. God is able to make one stand who even eats of these foods. Drop down to the middle of verse 6. The one who eats eats in honor of the Lord since he gives thanks to God. But hold on a minute. While the one who abstains, he or she also abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. So Paul's corrective here is not simply to say, hey, stop despising one another. Hey, stop passing judgment on one another. No, 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 no. Look what he does here instead. He reminds them that it is not their place to make such judgments. It is not their place. That right belongs to the Lord Jesus. That is his place to make those judgments. And the fact that each group is sincerely wanting to honor Jesus is a fact that must be acknowledged by everyone. This is part of the problem, right? They were allowing their differences to define them rather than Christ alone. They share a common Lord. They call upon a common Lord. They will be judged by a common Lord. One Lord, Jesus. They stand or fall in His presence. Look at verse 18. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. First and foremost, he exemplifies this, doesn't Paul does. I approve of this, these brothers that you're passing judgment on. And they are acceptable to God. I approve because they are acceptable to God. And they should be approved by you as well. So then, what was the right way? What was the right way then to handle these kinds of differences within the church? Look at a, a, a third word here, that third key word. It was the second one I mentioned this morning, the word welcome. Paul is clear in verse 1, welcome, or we could translate it receive, or we could translate that word as accept, welcome, receive, accept the one who is weak in faith. Now the emphasis is not on the one who's passing judgment, now it's going to those who are strong in faith. 
quote-unquote, strong in faith. And what does Paul say to them? He says, welcome, receive, accept the one who is weak in faith. Now, from the context, I believe that Paul is urging those stronger in faith, that he's urging them to, to embrace that other person as a true brother or sister in faith, and verse 4, as a fellow servant of Jesus Christ. Again, identifying their common, their common identity is emphasized here, rather than that's the brother who won't eat pork. <laughs> That's the person who only eats vegetables. Oh, wow. You know, we've got to correct this person. They're way off track. So Paul is saying here that they should receive, they should embrace, they should welcome these brothers and sisters. And they should do so not simply as brothers and sisters who need to be corrected. Does that make sense? We might welcome in and receive a brother or sister with whom we differ, but we label that person in our mind, oh, that's the brother who thinks this. That's the sister who believes such and such. And that becomes the identifying mark of that brother or sister. And there's always this sense that that brother or sister needs to be put in their place. They need to be corrected, that there's a taint There's a taint with them when they walk in the room and it's going to affect the body in negative ways. And so, oh, wow, there's that brother. Well, how you doing? Welcome, welcome. Now sit down and listen up. This is what we have to say to you. No, that's not what Paul is saying here. Paul is clear in verse 13 that truly welcoming or accepting a struggling believer means deciding never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. This is not passive, is it? This is active. This is active welcoming. This is active accepting of a brother. This is active receiving of a brother and sister with whom you disagree. And you are actively doing what? You are actively saying, I will never put a stumbling block or a hindrance in the way of a brother. What does that mean practically? Look at verse 21 of chapter 14. Paul spells it out. It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. As Paul expressed, take a look here. Paul expressed in another passage dealing with food and fellowship and stumbling. I mentioned it before, 1 Corinthians chapters 8 through 10. This is 1 Corinthians 8, 13. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat lest I make my brother stumble. It's hard to think about a more pointed biblical truth than this that rubs the American consumer, the individualistic American consumer, wrong, rubs them wrong. Right? This is almost antithetic. This is completely antithetical to what we hear out there in the media, what we hear in our culture, maybe even how we were raised to think about our rights. Do you see what Paul is saying here? He say, I'm gladly going to lay aside any right for the sake of my brother or sister, for the sake of my brother or sister, even though he knows he's in the right He's on the side of the truth. The brother or sister is actually wrong. (laughs) Does that make sense to you? What he's saying here, what he's encouraging them to, he's sacrificing his own rights for these brothers and sisters. Several, Several verses earlier, take a look. Paul explains why those who are stronger in faith should make such sacrifices. He says in verse 15, For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. You see, we are called to love, not destroy. Oh, Pastor Bryce, you're getting kind of extreme with the language there. Like destroy, that that sounds a little apocalyptic or it's like a little intense, like destroy, really? Destroy? It's Paul's word, destroy. What does he mean by it? He means injuring your brother or sister's faith by disdainful pressuring rather than loving persuasion. 
disdainful pressuring rather than loving persuasion, injuring their faith. And that is tempting them to act against their own conscience. We have to keep in mind what Paul argues in verse 14. We need to understand this dynamic here. Verse 14, take a look. I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it is unclean. Huh? What? Wait a minute. (laughs) Wait a minute. How is what God has said is clean now unclean for the person who is weak in faith? Does this make sense to you? It's unclean in the sense that for that person, crossing that dietary line would be an expression of disobedient doubt and not submissive faith. You see, the point doesn't have to be true or false. But for the person, if it's true, and it tempts them to disobedience, it tempts them to doubt-filled disobedience, there's a problem. Look at verse 23, the very last verse of this chapter. But whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats, because the eating is not from faith. And here's a verse that's often used out of context. Please don't do it. This is the context of it, though. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. Don't make that apply to everything under the sun. This applies to these matters of conscience where a person has these beliefs and says, well, this is wrong if I do this. Is the wrongness or the sin we're talking about here violating a divine dietary restriction. Is that the sin in question? No, the sin in question is doubt-inspired defiance of God. It's knowing, believing that something's wrong and saying, well, I know it's wrong, I'm going to do it anyway. You see, the problem then becomes not about food. The problem becomes about your heart, what you believe about God, about whether you'll surrender yourself to God and submit to God. That's the issue. That's what he wants to sensitize these readers to. We do not want to encourage that mindset in our brothers and sisters, do we? We don't want to tempt our brothers and sisters in those ways. We want to be a people who value faith and feed faith, don't we? To strengthen faith. Even when that faith on these kinds of issues is not accurate. It's not informed It's misguided in some sense. We need to commit ourselves to what Paul encourages in the next verses after verse 23. It's sneaking into our passage for tomorrow, Romans 15. But remember, the Bible never had numbers at the beginning, verse numbers. So these are just the next verses that Paul gives us, Romans 15, 1 and 2. We who are strong have an obligation that's strong in faith have an obligation to bear with the feelings of the weak, the failings of the weak, and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. Wow, radical love. Radical love. So, if we switch gears... If we switch gears from the past to the present right now, from there to here, as far as I know, we do not have any brothers or sisters in our faith family currently who believe it is sinful to eat certain foods or neglect certain Old Testament holy days. If that's you, then come and talk with me. I'd like to know more about your position. But because that is, as far as I know, not an issue, how then is this relevant for us? Right? How do we apply any of this stuff if we don't have these kinds of things going on in our church today? Maybe we can step back and simply ask, are there still topics on which we disagree? <laughs> well, that, now that you say that, you broadened out, absolutely there are topics on which we disagree as believers. Okay, so what does this tell us if we keep it general like that? How does this guide us? Well, number one, let me give you some encouragements here. 
in light of the passage. First of all, number one, we need to gauge the biblical importance of the issue over which we differ. You've got to stop and just step back and say, for example, I, you know, I feel confident for most of you. Most of you know that a disagreement over who's going to win the Super Bowl next year is different than a disagreement over the character of God or the significance of Christ's death on the cross. Yep, I, yeah, you're, I think you're all kind of, well, Bill's a little wah, he waffles on that. That could be a divine a mandate, right? Exactly. Uh, for, the, for the Seahawks. <laughs> They're God's anointed team. <laughs> Uh, no, we know the difference between these kinds of issues. Well, I disagree with this person over such and such, but, you know, that's, it's not a biblical issue. Some topics are harder to classify, aren't they? They're more difficult to kind of put in their place. There are cultural differences. There are political differences that can seem biblically important, but when we step back, we realize there are actually very few topics today that the Bible directly addresses. Much more of it is in the realm of the gray, maybe jagged line, not a straight line issue, but a jagged line. Let's think carefully about this. Let's use a biblical wisdom. Let's, let's, let's try to come at this this way rather than elevating everything to a status of biblical importance that just simply is not supported by the Bible. It's not supported by God's Word. What can be even harder then is when we do find those things that are spoken about in God's word, the harder thing can be separating what are the primary and secondary beliefs. That can get trickier at times. Christians have d disagreed for years about these kinds of things. And they've even broken ways, they've parted ways, they've broken unity, right? Broken fellowship over things that I think today we would say, that's really a secondary issue, that's really a secondary issue. Or what we might call a non-essential teaching. Essential and non-essential teaching. And when I say essential, I'm not simply even talk, just talking about salvation. Essential for salvation in Christ. But also essential in terms of Christian unity. What are the non-negotiables around which you and I are united in Jesus? What... If everything else were called into question, what would keep us united? What, if called into question in terms of a non-negotiable, could rupture our fellowship, right? If one of our elders, not any of these guys, but we'll call, let's call him Elder Phil, right? All of a sudden, Elder Phil is a new elder, and it comes to light that Elder Phil does not believe that Jesus is God in human flesh, believe that Jesus didn't rise from the dead. Whoa, we've got a problem, don't we? That's a much different issue that we have here. So what Paul is addressing here are secondary matters. These are non-essential matters. If we stick with those kinds of topics then, the non-essential secondary matters, if we're able to kind of sort that out and figure out what those are, if we stick with those, then uh, we've got to move on to thinking about number two. In secondary matters, when we're talking about disagreements, we need to consider relevant conscience issues. Not every disagreement over a subject on a secondary matter addressed by Scripture is a conscience issue. It has any bearing on a person's conscience. For example, you may believe that Christ is going to come and set up a literal kingdom on the earth for a literal thousand years based in the Middle East. Calling that the millennium, right? Right? Others believe the millennium is right now as Christ reigns at the right hand of God as Lord, right? So you've got premillennialism and an amillennialism. Now, those are, those are, that's a subject on which Christians disagree about this, but there's really no conscience issue re related to that. I'm not going to cause my brother or sister to stumble necessarily in just talking about that issue or because of that issue by itself in terms of how it works out in our faith. But what about the difference, for example, between those who baptize infants and those who baptize only confessing believers? Okay, so if you have that difference, which I would also classify as a secondary matter, although an important issue. It does have its kind of tendrils into other issues that can be, that are very important. So we, we want to think and, and, and talk about those carefully as brothers and sisters have done over the centuries. But what if, for example, a, a believing family finds themselves in a church uh, 
that pressures them one way or the other so that in doubt-inspired defiance, they act against their conscience. Well, I feel pressured to baptize my baby, even though I don't believe that's the, the right way. Or I, I, I'm pressured to not baptize my child and wait, even though I don't believe that's the right thing to do. You see, that can have a conscience implication, that secondary belief. And of course, we can go through lists of things. Here's what I'm going to tell you, brothers and sisters. The, the situation in this chapter is so unique it's very hard to always kind of find issues today that line up with it perfectly. It really, it really is hard. And Christians who say this, this passage speaks directly to this issue, eh, hold on, slow down a little bit. For example, what if I were to say to you, well, I believe it's dishonoring to God to go to a rated R movie. Number one, does anything in God's word explicitly say don't go to rated R movies? No. No. So right away you have a difference with what this passage is addressing because this passage is addressing a topic which Jesus spoke to, Peter spoke to, Paul spoke to. It was abundantly clear about the removal of the Old Testament dietary restriction. Very clear. The other one starts to become a gray area. But I still think there are principles here. How about somebody who grew up in a very strict family and believes alcohol, drinking any alcohol is a sin? Now, that is an issue that Scripture speaks clearly to. It does not say drinking alcohol is a sin. It says drunkenness is sin. Do not become drunk with wine. So there's where we're on firmer ground to be able to say, okay, what do we do with that brother or sister? The Word clearly says this, but they hold to this. Well, here we are. We've got some tools now that, that God has given us. And that's what brings us to this final point. Number three, above all, take a look. We need to pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Those aren't my words. Those are the words in verse 19. Take a look. That's what Paul says. Brothers and sisters, if there was one thing you take away from this passage this morning, I pray it is this, that God's clear guidance in verse 19 is what you hold on to. It says this, so then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. That is the principle driving everything Paul's saying in this chapter. You want to get down right to the heart of it? This is what Paul knows to be true. This is what he's holding to. That is the principle that he is working from in everything that he's saying. Think about what's happening here. Many believers in Rome were placing these secondary issues over the primary issues of loving one another and unity in Jesus. Those are far more important than what you believe about that food. Those are far more important than what you believe about the millennium. Those are far more important than what you believe about baptism. Those are far more important than what you believe about you fill in the blank. Despising instead of accepting. Passing judgment rather than loving and sacrificing for one another. Brothers and sisters, the number of issues out there that could, not should, but could potentially divide us is almost limitless. It's huge. Just think about the sad reality, both before and during the pandemic, of believers breaking fellowship with one another over things like music, or masks, or programming, or personalities, or political affiliation. I say shame on us. Shame on us. And God's word drives that point home very clearly here. Better than trying to sort out every issue that could potentially divide us is committing ourselves in all things to pursuing peace in the body of Christ. Upbuilding in the body of Christ. Committing ourselves to personally building up that brother and sister who is in faith even when we believe them to be terribly wrong. When we know that they're wrong, we're committed to building them up in faith and guarding their faith, protecting their faith, cherishing their faith. When there is a difference like this, when there is a disagreement like this, what do you desire more? Check your heart. What do you desire more? For the other person to feel they are wrong or feel they are loved? Paul's correction 
God's correction is the correction we need when we disagree and are tempted to put that person in a category, to put them in a box, to push them out of the way, to forget that they serve one Lord, the Lord that we call upon as well. Tempted to to turn them into something else, that person who just needs to be corrected, that aberrant brother or sister, that erring brother or sister. The key issue when it comes to such disagreements is not first whether you are right and they are wrong. The issue is whether or not your love and commitment to your brother or sister is bigger than the difference that, is, that you're tempted to divide over. Is that love and commitment bigger than the differences that are tempting you to divide? The, the, Paul defines the weaker brother here in verse 14, chapter 14, verse 2, right? He, though he defines the weaker brother in the opening verses of this chapter, I wonder how he would assess the strong, quote-unquote, disciple who neglected the love and the unity emphasized in this chapter. How would he assess that person? Wouldn't a weak a person who was weak in faith in regard to what's being said here be far more dangerous and far more destructive than any misplaced belief in dietary restrictions? I say that because we can look at this and say, oh, the weaker brother, but I'm strong in faith. I know I can eat anything. I know what God's Word says about the dietary restrictions of the Old Testament. But we are not living this out. We show ourselves to not believe this. Then you are the one who is weak in faith. You become the one who is weak in faith. And I, I put it to you, and I think it's clear from this passage, your weakness in faith in that regard is far more destructive than the person who doesn't eat pork, who doesn't eat whatever. So when we talk about weak and strong, we need to do so very carefully, don't we? Very carefully. And that brings us to a final point here. Please don't miss this other foundational idea that's here It's not one of the points on the screen, but just think about this. The other foundational idea here, in addition to love and unity, is what we might call gospel-inspired humility. Gospel-inspired humility. Did you hear the gospel proclaimed in this chapter? Yeah, I didn't read it, but it's here. It's in verses 8 and 9. Go back and look at it. Let's look at it together. Verses 8 and 9, what does he say? For if we live, the body of Christ, those who follow Christ. If we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that He might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. There's the gospel. And what does the gospel tell us? It reminds us of what God was doing through Christ. It reminds us of the greatest and simplest, the the, the most basic, the original confession of true faith, which is only three words in English, two words in Greek. It is this, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. That's the gospel, what the gospel produces. That is the cry of saving faith. Why is it not my place to make divisive judgments on secondary matters in the lives of my brothers and sisters? Because Jesus is Lord over that brother or sister, not me. He hasn't appointed me to be that that brother or sister's judge in this way. And if he is my Lord and I confess him as such, then I will, number one, I will leave that matter to him. I will trust him for that. Number two, I will acknowledge my brother or sister as a fellow servant of Christ. And number three, I will love that person as God in Christ has loved me. He doesn't despise our weaknesses, does he? Does Christ despise our weaknesses? No. He no longer passes judgment on me because he took my judgment. You see, I'm spelling out these gospel implications, but really it's right there in chapter 15, verse 7. 
Just drop down into the next chapter. What does he say? He says, therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you. Remember that word, welcome? Therefore, accept one another as Christ has accepted you. Therefore, receive one another as Christ has received you. And when we stop and we put it in those terms, and we think about it from that perspective, it begins to make sense, doesn't it? What Paul is arguing here. Why he's bringing what the words and the correction to bear that he's bringing, it begins to make sense. We understand why Paul is correcting them in this way and the importance of love and unity and humility in the body of Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray and let's ask God to help us in this very way when we find ourselves in similar places.